All right, man. What up, everybody? It is your boy VQ. This is your Impact Lounge Under Siege review for 2024. I usually do these TNA Plus shows really late throughout the week uh, because I don't watch them live. Like, I, I mean, I always say I don't watch Impact live. I definitely don't watch these shows live, just because they're too long for me. Um, I'm just, an, I'm just old, man. I can't sit up watching fucking wrestling for so many hours, but, uh, I actually did watch this for the most part as it aired. I was probably behind 45 minutes. Uh, my wife was at work. So I said, you know what? I'm going to run this thing. And then I decided, oh shit, let me check the basketball schedule. The, uh, the Clippers were playing and then the Indiana fever were playing which has always been my WNBA team. Let me make that be known. It's not because they got Caitlin Clark. Um, They were both playing. Uh, Fever had their first preseason game. Clippers were in game six of the playoffs. Uh, I learned very quickly that the Clippers were not going to win that game because they had no heart or no fight, no drive, no determination. And um, I turned that off. And then I was watching the Fever on the WNBA app. And I don't know if the app like crashed a little because – Kaylin Clark was playing, but it was just freezing too much for my taste. So I said, okay, let's do it. Let's do Under Siege. So I, I watched it for the most part as I was airing, about 45 minutes behind, like I said. I always have to point it out, like I'm not a wrestling mark, so there are a lot of things that take precedence when I'm watching. Like I won't watch wrestling over basketball. It's not a shot at anyone who watches wrestling and watches every show and everything as it airs it's not a shot towards anyone it's just you know my own personal situation but i was happy to to watch it live because i wanted to review it a little bit quicker this week so if it's your first time here this has been the number one place to be for the tna and the impact fan for quite some time i am honest Uh, if it's good i'm gonna say it's good if it's bad i'm gonna say it's bad if it's good i'm not gonna say it's bad I think that's a a misconception people have about me that Hammerstone and and, and Josh Alexander are going to have this amazing match. And then I'm like, oh, that was trash. Like we can differ on opinions, but, you know, for the most part, if something is excellent, you're not going to see me get on here and and trash it. Um, Again, not a Mark podcast. I have a lot of TNA fans who, oh, cool, you know, here's a nice, nice subscriber base. Let's check this out. And then I get on here and I'm like really, really honest about the product and like, oh, you know, we can't have this. Um, man, last time I opened a show like that, this dude, Greg Blanton, man, let me give you some backstory on this dude. He's been a subscriber since like day one. He's watching this right now. Okay. Um, he has never said a single, he comments on a lot. He has never said a single positive thing about TNA in the comments. Um, let me pull this one up here. So, you know, I talk about. You know, I lose subscribers, I gain subscribers. I was talking about um, a particular episode. I, you know, I, I basically said what I just said to where I uh, I lose a lot of subscribers because people say, okay, here's a TNA podcast. And then they kind of realize I'm honest about the product. So this dumbass, um, BQ, you say your target audience is TNA fans, but you dropped all reference of impact and TNA from the name of your channel and made it all about you that is why you have many tna fans and many others coming and going on your channel first of all coming and going means that you're you are subscribing then unsubscribing subscribing unsubscribing some people cannot stay away i'm fully aware of this uh, because it's the number one place to be so uh you know a lot of people do leave and then they said you know what got it really want to know what bq thinks about this and they come back which um Greg Blanton is one of them. I 100% have made this channel about me now. I don't work for TNA. I never have. I have friends there. I've had friends there. Um, But I'm to the point that I can stand on my own as a brand. I don't have to say uh, this is the Impact Lounge, you know, as far as the name of my channel. I I don't have to do that anymore. Like this is, I built this shit. They did not help me build this they, there was no one from tna is like hey we're going to retweet your stuff we're going to do this like I, I built this with my knowledge of youtube that i have uh gained over the years you know um but yeah i, I can call my channel whatever i want i was i was unaware that i couldn't 
Uh, most don't want to hear all this negative BS you keep spewing. Again, he has never said one positive thing on this channel. It has long become stale and divides the fans. You need to be much more upbeat and positive, otherwise you're not helping TNA whatsoever. I had a I had a uh, conversation after the rebellion saying, "Hey, we," to my face saying, "Hey, we love hearing the good and the bad. We need to hear the good and the bad." Um, I had a conversation with someone else that we don't always agree with your opinion, but we value it. Okay. Um, and again, if something's good, I'm going to say it's good, man. Like, uh, even though the channel's negative BQ, a lot of this year I've enjoyed what they're doing. 2024, 23, 22, man. Like, yeah, you're probably in for a pretty negative ride with me. Uh, but I've I've enjoyed a lot of what they're doing. I've praised a lot of their social media. He goes on to say, BQ's thinking he really thinks he's persuading. Now, just previous to this, he talked about the, unless you're more upbeat and positive, you're not helping TNA whatsoever. He wants me, me to be a mark. But then also says, and BQ's thinking he really believes he's persuading TNA management to react to his opinions and make changes. LOL. They don't care what he or any other podcaster says or feels about their product, which is, which is not true. Um, again, I can, I can, I mean, I'm, I won't. I can list off three people behind the scenes that are subscribed. Uh, and, and probably about 20% of the roster follows me on, on Twitter. So, um, I don't think I'm as irrelevant as he is trying to make it sound like I am uh, with TNA. Now, now, see, now he's being negative. TNA is nothing more than an assembly line of production with whatever parts, talents they have available to get shows finished for the final product we see on TV weekly. Nothing more, nothing less. Same old thing. So, yeah, I, I, I can agree with that. Um, I think you might as well be positive because he's not changing anything in TNA. But um, I think most of my loyal subscribers can can agree that a lot of the things that i've come up with my ideas which i'm not totally taking credit but have played out on television or played out on social media and have worked i'm not saying they got it from me but when i'm saying hey they need to do this this and this on social media and then they do it and it works that clearly i know what i'm talking about this is your under siege review believe it or not I know I'm going off here a little bit. I'm just reminding you guys, my platform's a lot bigger than yours. Do not do not get on here talking funny with me. Uh, real quick, personal thing. I don't usually get into too much personal. I've officially applied for retirement from the U.S. Air Force Reserves, so I got to do about six more months. Uh, once you once you apply to retire, you still got to work like half a year. Uh, I did 15 years active duty, and people always say, "Well, why didn't you finish the 20?" Um, back in 2014, whatever, uh, the president downsized the military. Uh, I was in a position that where my rank and job were over overmanned. So uh, I, I, I became a victim of that. Um, and then I joined the reserves. And, and then every time you're in the reserves, every time you do a day, every day that you serve goes towards your retirement. So I actually got up to about 17 and a half active years. Uh, and the difference between the retirements is if you retire, retire active duty, like Mike Gilbert's going to do, he'll get paid the next day or the next month. Uh, with me, I don't get paid till I'm 60. It doesn't matter if I did 19 active years and, and, and one year of the reserves, I will not get paid till I'm 60. So I was trying to get to that active duty reserve, uh, retirement. Um, but I just decided I, I, I was at peace with the fact that that wasn't going to happen. Uh, I stopped loving what I was doing going in. I'm, I'm Always been like proud to serve, but I stopped loving going into work. Um, just sitting through the briefings and, and doing this and this, like it just became tiresome to me. And at, I mean, I'm, I'm getting old. I am old. I'm 44. I didn't want to be that dude around 50 chasing a retirement in the reserves because there are people who do that. Um, you know, they're 50, they're, they're uh, mid 50s, you know, chasing that, that retirement. That wasn't, that was not something I wanted. So uh, for myself and I've got my fire, my boss initiative going fire, my boss 2025. And that's one of the one of the parts of that is to retire. And then um, obviously my other job will play a role in that before 2025. So uh, that's personal thing going on with me. So uh, six more months and then uh, I am I am checking out. I'm punching out. I've weighed the pros and cons and decided that I I don't necessarily need uh 
a retirement that early. So um, let's do this. Let's get into your undersea reviews, party people. I wonder how many of you punched out at this point. Maybe some of you liked hearing me go on, go off on Greg Blanton. Fucking dumb motherfucker, man. Um, he's watching right now. He's still watching. That's the crazy part. Okay, so we're going to get into this. Um, under siege. All right. Uh, this wasn't my favorite. What do you guys call it? The premium live event, right? This wasn't my favorite. I thought the card was very random, which yeah, I don't think I, I, I'm not as like. You can have a ran random matches on these because they're not big pay-per-views, you know? It's okay to, to be a little random. Like, if you're doing house shows, you know, there's not a lot of house shows in wrestling anymore. A lot of house shows have very random matches because you're trying some things out. Um, it was, but it, man, but they definitely did throw some shit together. If this were a pay-per-view, I would be shitting on it from top to bottom. But it's just under siege. It's the show that came after the D pay-per-view, which is Rebellion. You know, we don't have to take it too seriously, but um, it definitely was it definitely was random. It was not my favorite show. I thought there were some redeeming qualities, though. It's not something that I'm going to say, oh, you know, every single match I was seeing here was the, you know, the drizzle shits. That's not not what it was at all. But there was some bad. There was some bad. There was some good. This kicked off with part of the bad, which was Rhino versus VSK. Um, Rhino is still a thing on our television, and he he really doesn't need to be. Like, I'm, it's much like Tommy Dreamer. I, I can respect everything he's done throughout his career in ECW. I think he was in WCW, too. I, don't, I really don't remember. Um, WWE, TNA. I respect all those things. Um, I just don't want to see him wrestle anymore. Just kind of, you know, built like an iPhone goes out there and, and we're just there to see the gore. You know, I, I can just do without it. Um, VSK, I like VSK. I just had a conversation with VSK a couple couple weeks ago about the learning tree and how much further that could have gone. Uh, but, but TNA did not agree with that. So this pre-show, this Rhino versus VK, first of all, is on the pre-show. This was Jobber Central. This was the worst pre-show they have put together by far in a very long time. This was this was just squash matches, which is fine if you want to do that. It's just not usually what they do for the pre-shows, especially the Rebellion one, which was really good. And then we've got, you know, Rhino versus VSK. I like VSK. I would love to see him stick around. This, like at this point, they're just putting matches together for Rhino to do the gore and that that's going to pop people. They've been doing it a lot in 2024. He's kicked off a couple um, nights of tapings when they're doing Explosion. I just don't think there's there's evidence of support in 2024 like people want to see the gore. Because Moose does the spear. Uh, Rosemary does the spear. Uh, Boopy does that spear from the second rope. If you don't know who I'm talking about, Boopender. Uh, but we haven't seen him on TV in a long time. Like There's plenty of spears on this show. I'm sure someone else has it in their arsenal as well. Like the gore is not that serious. And then GM Miller interviews Ace Austin, and he, he's chance uh, he's challenging Mustafa Ali. I got it on the first time that time uh, for the exhibition title later by, later that night without Chris Bay by his side. So they're kind of man, they're still kind of telling that story about ABC. It looked like they they pulled back on it a little bit because frankly they need the tag teams. And I don't know that much about Bullet Club. I've never been a Bullet Club fan, but I don't think over the course of the history, they just kind of broke up Bullet Club teams randomly. I know like there were storylines where they needed to because someone was leaving, going to another company. But I, I can't think because there's I've seen enough Bullet Club stuff on my timeline over the years. I don't feel like there's, oh, we just need to freshen things up because they're stale. So we're going to break them up. You know, I, I just don't feel like they, they do that a whole lot. I thought I thought the uh, production on this backstage segment looked so much better. Like the the shadows were not as dark, you know. They, it just looked significantly better. The show looks significantly better. I don't know why. Maybe I'll find out one day. I don't know why the TNA shows cannot look like this. The television programs, Impact, cannot 
just look like this. I don't know why they have to go into, into um, post-production. First thing they do is go to the fucking color contrast setting, pull it all the way down so that the blacks are as deep as humanly possible and everything blends together, which also makes some of the other colors lose their vibrance. I don't understand. They've been doing it for years and years. I don't know why it can't just look like this. Very, very frustrating. After this, the FBI, um, I don't know why I thought this was going to be a six-man tag team match. I guess the, the website that I was reading when I was doing my preview had it listed as a, a six-man match. But this is, um, it looks like Guido is just a, a manager at this point, which is fine. I don't really want to see him wrestle. Like, I mean, he's just as old as, as Rhino and Tommy Dreamer and stuff. There's, there's no scenario where this dude needs to wrestle. I'm, an, I'm becoming an FBI guy. I said it before. I've always liked Zach Clayton. Uh, I watch Jersey Shore, so I love that he's part of TNA right now. He is a reoccurring character, but he doesn't. he's not a – because I see people say, oh, well, you know, what a great rub for TNA. It, it's not that serious. Uh, he's reoccurring, but he's more in the background. He, he doesn't speak a whole lot on camera. There is one episode where he teaches – the guys to wrestle and that they have mock wrestling matches, which was pretty entertaining. Um, but I'm, I'm a fan of the dude. At this point, the Jersey Shore rub is not that strong. I mentioned this a week or so ago. Like if you go on JWoww's Twitter, I mean, there's not, it, it has the engagement that my tweets do because they're my age. If this was, if Jersey Shore was a Twitter was a thing when Jersey Shore, you know, Twitter was a thing when Jersey Shore came out. It just wasn't a thing thing. It was it was relatively new. These fools would have engagement up the up the ass, you know. Um, it's it's more for more for a younger crowd in that sense. They wrestled three job guys from Shikara, I guess. Um, the, I don't know the battery or battery. I could have done without this. There was there was a bit of a um, a botch at the end. Zach Col Zach Collins, that's a basketball player. Um, Zach Clayton doing his pop up, doing a pop up neck, neck breaker. It was, it's, it, that looks like a hard move to pull off. Kind of throwing up in the air, trying to catch him with a neck breaker. It looks very difficult to pull off, but it's, I doubt that many people are watching this. They'll tighten this up. I'm looking forward to the FBI being a part of this tag team division going forward. And then, um, I guess this was also on the card, right? We got, Digital media champion, the prestigious digital media title on the line. On the line. Laredo Kid versus Casey Navarro. As if this title already meant nothing, Laredo Kid now holds it. It is progressively getting less important. Uh, and there's been people who have held this belt that we've said, whoa, they can do something with it. I'm talking about. Uh, and call him Zack Ryder, fucking Matt Cardona, Brian Myers, Joe Hendry, even uh, Jordan Grace when she had it. There's people where, yo, they might be able to do something with this. They didn't. So I can assure you, Laredo Kid is not. Him, when he won the title and he put that shit down like he was Cody Rhodes finishing his story at WrestleMania, man, I was like, yo, this, this title, bro. He took on Casey Navarro. We have seen him on screen before. We have seen him um, do some impact in the past. He's pretty talented. He's not that talented to receive a digital media championship opportunity. He was. Uh, this match was initially slated for Rich Swan, which Rich Swan probably would have won a title because Laredo Kid. If, if anybody screams transitional champion in this company, it's Laredo Kid. Or uh, as Tom calls him, kid. Um, but yeah, this was, I mean, this was fun for what it was. Laredo Kid has now won two matches in TNA, so he's on a on a real hot streak. All right, we get into the actual Under Siege card. This was not off to a good start. Josh Alexander and Eric Young took on Frankie Kazarian and Steve Macklin. I'm watching this match, and I'm trying to figure out why it was put together. I, I could not for the life of me remember. I didn't watch last week's Impact or the week before. 
because what I explained, I was there live. So I just didn't want to watch them again. I wanted to preserve my good memories of the card and not listen to Tom Hannafin and a kick out and, and just all this shit that like kind of bothers me. I was watching Under Siege with my, my, um, my son, and I pointed it out to him once. There were, someone was going for a pin. I was like, all right, listen for it, and I kick out. And he did it, of course. And then he did it throughout the whole fucking night. And my son's like, oh, my God. I've had people tell me they've, they say jokingly that I've, I have ruined their, um, their enjoyability factor when it comes to watching TNA because now they can't stop hearing, and I kick out anyway i could so because i didn't see these shows on tv i watched them live i didn't see them on tv i wasn't fully aware of the stories i don't know why this match was put together i don't know where steve macklin had anything to do with this i mean there was a segment backstage where they were talking about taking business taking care of business like what is what business does steve macklin have with any of these guys now he's, he's wrestled these guys and he had a feud with josh but it just seemed like he was just inserted into this where they were just trying to have a a dream a dream match, you know. I could I could be wrong, and I likely am. There's probably some kind of story that put this together. I just didn't know what it was. I had a prediction that Josh Alexander was trans, transitioning to to not wrestling with the headgear. I was wrong. Not only is he wrestling with the headgear, his tag team partners are as well. So Eric Young, he came out looking like Ben Stiller from Something Without Mary. If you guys understand that reference. Uh, whatever he had hanging from his ear, some kind of gauze or I, I don't know. I'm talking about Eric Young here. Then Eric Young put a, uh, put headgear on. So I was if I tell you if Eric Young wasn't wrestling without a shirt, I wouldn't have known who was in the ring. They looked so similar on TV. This was a great opening match. I told you that there's redeeming qualities about this show. It's impossible to put these four guys in a ring and it not be good. Impossible. Uh, that said, I thought Frankie Gazarian and Steve Macklin were going to win. They felt the need to give Eric Young his win back and uh, I, so that they can do a rubber match. The problem in doing that is you just had Frankie Gazarian win, or excuse me, he just lost last week. And Steve Macklin is losing as well. But you had Frankie Kazarian lose last week in a impromptu number one contenders match in his street clothes. The match was totally unnecessary. You could have given Josh Alexander the number one contendership any other way. Like this, it was so unnecessary. I, I really disliked that on the show. The match was cool. I thought it could have used a little bit of a build because I wanted to see Frankie Kazarian the heel and Josh Alexander, the golden boy, have a little bit of a story. Like I wanted to see that dynamic. Instead, Santino approves the match for whatever reason. Like I don't understand. Like I just don't get it. I really don't. Hey, hey you're in your normal clothes. Let's fucking do this. Is this for the number one contendership for the world title, but we're just going to wrestle in our fucking clothes. So, you have Frankie Gazarian hot out of rebellion, loses a very unnecessary match, and then loses here too. So now he has no momentum whatsoever going into whatever he's going to continue to do with Eric Young. I don't know what Steve Macklin, his, his role is in this. I don't know what Josh Alexander's role is in this. It just seemed like these two guys were most likely what I'm assuming happened was that they were told to look for tag team partners backstage. I, I'm going to assume it was something along those lines, but it was a, it was a good opening match. I just, um, I really didn't expect Josh and Eric Young to win. After this, Havoc takes on Ash by Elegance. I don't want to start, start calling her Ash by Elegance because I'm a big fan of hers. I always have since the day I ever seen her wrestle. I don't know why, because when she debuted in NXT, that match wasn't good either. I think it might have been against Blue Pants. They had hyped it for several weeks, uh, showing that she was a fitness competitor, video packages. And then she, and this was a pretty hot period with NXT uh, from a development standpoint. And um, at the time, everything they were doing was like really working. So they really hyped their debut up. She came out, came out and it was very underwhelming. It wasn't bad. It was just underwhelming. 
And then she, the character never, never got off the ground. But they were they were teasing it like it, we had a future world champion on our hands. So I, I'm a, I'm just a fan of hers for whatever reason. I, I think I just I have great memories from that period of TN, of uh, NXT. Tyson Kidd was down there, and Tyler Breeze and these dude. I, I have um, you know the early Alexa Bliss days. I just have great memories from those times. So that's why people like Big Con, Ash by Elegance. I might not like what they're doing on screen, but I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna knock them too much. I'm not gonna say, hey, I'm not a fan of these people. I don't want to see these people. I'm not gonna say that. But this was borderline. Havoc versus Ash was one of the worst knockouts matches they've had. This was awful. The problem is, and it's man, it's okay for a bad match to happen every once in a while, especially on this show that doesn't matter. But Ash is having too many bad matches. That's the problem. He, she had the match with, uh, she had. Well, I thought the last match with Zaya Brookside, uh, Queen of the Rubber match, was pretty good. The first match was horrible, and then she kind of had some squash matches, which, you know, she did some things, but it's not really clicking at the moment. But I will say, the character for me is great. The personnel, personal concierge. I always say that incorrectly, but he's great as well. I'm, I'm into, I'm into the presentation of this. There was, there was like a month ago. I was, I was dying. Ash was gonna run off, but she had to put her hand out first for him to grab it and take her off. I mean, I'm, I'm into this. What they were doing with the holy water and the garlic, it was cheesy, but I didn't hate it. What I hated was that there was no build to this match. This was a random match thrown together, and all of a sudden, Ash is like, "Oh, we need holy water, and we need you." You don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, if there was some kind of story going up for three or four weeks, where she was feeding into this and and feeding into what their gimmick was, and that she was scared of them, then this could have worked a little bit better. But that's not what we got. We just got a random match, and then randomly she's, you know, trying to counter the black magic. It was, it came off like a comedy match when it probably didn't need to. And then, you know, Ash wins with, like Stone Cold Steve Austin says, the worst roll up in the history of the business. And uh, then she chokes her out with, with garlic, which just, man, again, if if. She was choking her out, but she had like anger in her in her eyes. And she ran there, she's like this bitch, and just starts choking choking her out. Like that could have worked, but it just it came off like a comedy match, and it didn't. It really didn't need to. Decay does not have to be involved in comedy. They were doing comedy. This was about two years ago. I hated everything Decay was doing. It was really uh, comedy heavy, especially Rosemary started doing comedy, and I thought it was a, a huge miss. I think they need to continue to be kind of darker characters. Uh, but what do I know? I'm a fan. This did this did not work. I don't. Uh, they're just trying to, you know. Obviously, Ash is going to wrestle Rosemary. It's probably going to be a much much better match. They're getting her up to Jordan, man. They're they're trying, man. They're trying. Gia Miller, Miller, Gia Miller interviews Broken Matt and Speedball Mountain backstage. What I had been saying about Speedball Mountain was like, these guys always lose. What are they doing in the main event? I mean, they cut a promo where Trent Seven even said, we've made it. I'm paraphrasing. We made it to the main event of Under Siege. Like, it doesn't get any bigger than that. So right when I was ready to hit the fast forward button, Matt Hardy saved this segment. I don't even know what to call the, those garments that he wears. But he gives one to the ball of speed and Trent the seventh. And this shit was from this point here, even though Speedball was acting like a goof. From this point here, this match was off to the races. We're going to get to this main event. This shit went from I give two shits to, to being more entertained than I have in a main event match on Impact in a long time. After this, we got Joe Hendry versus Zachary Wentz. This was another random match. This was just done. Well, the, the Rascals don't beat anybody at this point. Um, 
I think when I went to the tapings, all three of them had a match and they had a tag match and they lost them all. And I was like, okay. I see where this is fucking going. Joe Hendry is over right now. He is over with the TNA audience. He is getting clicks and views from the non-TNA audience is what, what you want. What they're always begging the people to do on Twitter with their outdated strategies. This is orga- this is happening happening organically. And it made me realize that's why they're keeping this feud going with AJ Francis. Because AJ Francis, whether you like him or not, is getting he's getting clicks, he's getting views, he's getting engagement. People who don't like him are following what he's doing. I had a conversation with him as well. He said Cheez Its, you know, who was sponsoring him now pays him more money based off the Joe Hendry song. And because that brought more you know, I don't know. I don't want to say brought more eyeballs to tweeze it, to tweeze it, to cheese it. So you know, you know what I'm saying though. But this this has been like a mutual, mutually beneficial feud for both the wrestlers. It's been one of the better stories going on, and it's doing it's doing work for the company right now. AJ Francis has had TikTokers with him, rappers with him, and I've said if you don't, you're not familiar with a lot of old school hip hop. Bun Bun B is a big deal. DJ Who Kid, big deal. Like these are not nobodies in the hip hop world. Like maybe now when hip hop has become what it is, the younger audience is not super familiar. But TNA has an older audience. These are these are big deals. Uh and he's gonna probably continue to do this. The Sean Merrimans and and uh D'Angelo Williams and you know these are these these are names. TNA is benefit, benefiting from this. This feud is probably going to keep going on. The uh, the Joe Hendry apology got over on social media. They of course have not taken advantage of that at all from from a social media standpoint on Twitter. You go to their Twitter and it's there's there's business as usual on there. It's not um, old boys on vacation, so they're not doing the bullshit. But it just highlights. It's just it's just whatever. Like they're not really. They're not, they weren't prepared for this, and they're not making any changes uh, to help the situation at all. But Joe Hendry is over. He's probably to the point that you're going to have to find a way to get him, high, you know, continue just just to get him more featured on the show, um, put him in in some situations and some matches that and storylines that people have interest in. But I think it's going to continue with AJ Francis for a little bit because there's just too many eyeballs on what they're doing. AJ Francis finally is wrestling on NWA here pretty soon. So on uh, the next episode, chill. So um, I'm interested to see how that goes. I want to see how he comes off in, in NWA. But um, they got to keep this going. This was just done to get Joe Hendry a win. Uh, the, the people were behind him. Uh, I would have preferred they just kind of, I mean, this was already a throwaway car. They should have throw, thrown like Jack Price in here or something like that. Because Joe Hendry was going to win. You know, the Rascals don't need to keep losing each and every week. These guys were just the tag team champions like three months ago. But Joe Hendry wins. They need to, they got to keep this going, man. I, I'm, I'm serious. Get on social media and, and figure this out. Figure this out. Instead of just posting your highlights and Ash by Elegance clips and all that, like, let's figure this out. Impact TNA. I'm going to call it impact the day I die, I swear. Then we got the Knockouts World Championship match, Spitfire, with Lars Fredrickson. Once they said he was in their corner, I was like, fuck, they're winning. They took on Alicia Edwards and Masha Slamovich. Unfortunately, I had this match spoiled for me. There's probably been two matches in wrestling in the last several years that I've wanted to watch live because I wanted to know the outcome as it happened. The other one was, oddly enough, this was when I had some fan of AEW was um, Britt Baker and Ty Conti because at the time I was a really big Ty Conti fan and she was wrestling for the title. I remember being very into that. I didn't think she was going to win, but I was, I was uh, very interested in it. It was in a pay-per-view and this was another one. I wanted to see this as it aired. Um, I wanted to celebrate with the system. Uh, that didn't happen. 
so I was watching it and just kind of watched it like I did everything else here. I was just like, uh, let's just get to the finish. And uh, Alicia let Masha do most of the work, and then they won. I was I was still very pleased with the outcome. We did it, folks. We are we are we have brought the titles home to the system. Uh, so I'm 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 I didn't think the day would come where Alicia would have any kind of gold or any kind of victory under her belt. I swear to you. As much as I love love this girl on screen, I just didn't think the day was ever, ever going to happen. We got to talk about the finish of the match, though. The fucking pedigree that she hit. So Alicia has four, had a four finishers in her course, in her time in, in TNA. Flatliner. The Bronco Buster. Not the Bronco Buster, but the sit-out face buster. Uh, she had a neck breaker for one match. That she called something. I don't know. They said it was her new finisher. It lasted one match. And now the pedigree. None of these look good. Uh, you know you're not going to get Matt Classics out of Alicia. But she's got to find a finisher that works for her. I swear to you. There's there's something out there. I promise you there's something out there. It probably should invi- involve some kind of strike. Maybe a spinning heel kick or something. Uh, but these are not working for her. But it looks like going forward, it's going to be a lot of... I'm probably giving you guys a boring review this morning. I'm sorry. It, it's early. Um, going forward, it looks like Masha is going to do the majority of the work. Now, after this, this was a little bit later. They were celebrating with the system. And Masha you know, slapped the bell and started talking in Russian. What I don't want is for them to be feuding with each other. That I'm a little worried about. I don't think, and I keep saying this, I don't think Masha's going to join the system. I think she's going to be involved in the system, and that could be very entertaining. But if it's she's involved in the system because she's like semi-feuding with Alicia, that's going to be, like, I don't want to see that. So I don't know what the hell they're doing. Just, can we just have these two on the same page, please, and just defend the titles? I've also said now that these girls are the champions, they can probably get away with not defending the titles very often they're going to have a, a, a rematch with spitfire there's nothing for them after that so don't force them to wrestle but yes the time has come Alicia, tag team champion i'd probably be more excited but you know, like i said i just didn't get to celebrate it with her as it happened because i am part of the system if you didn't know okay then we got rich swan versus jake something This initial match was Hammerstone versus Jake. When I was previewing the match, I said the match deserved the build. We might get one by default now. It was the one match on the card where I'm like, yo, they got something here. But they have to build it. Instead, it was like bumping into each other backstage. Now we're going to wrestle. I had also said neither of these guys can lose. So it made it interesting. Like, neither of them should be losing right now. They were gifted. Well, not so much for Hammerstone. He wasn't cleared to wrestle. But he was gifted. They were gifted the opportunity to give him a new opponent. I don't know why his opponent wasn't Casey Navarro. Instead, they put him in a match where he still loses. He was going to lose to Hammerstone, and now he still loses. I'm really close to being out on Jake. Not anything against him personally. I've met the dude before he was part of TNA a couple times. My kids like him. But I keep pointing out the presentation. He's just a dude walking around backstage. Oh, screaming, loud noises. There's no personality. He's walking around half naked backstage. He's the only wrestler doing it. Like he just, it, it's like he's always ready to wrestle. Um, he comes out, his his entrance is just, this is Jake something, where they should be saying he's six foot whatever, he weighs two hundred seventy whatever, he hails from here. Like it sh- his entrance should be a big deal. Nothing about the presentation of this dude is a big deal. Like the fans are behind him. Like they've been wanting to see him you know, do something for a while. 
but they're not making him look like a star on TV in any way. He's just coming off like a guy. And they had an opportunity here to get him back on track. Now, he might feud with first class here a little bit. Maybe he's going to get a, a, a win over Rich Swan, or they're going to do a rubber match. Maybe he's going to wrestle AJ. Maybe he's going to team with Joe Hendry. Like, we don't know what they're going to do, right? But why do we care at this point? I, we're just, are, are we still on that train of like, hey, he's a future world champion? Clearly, they don't think so. They probably promised him a push. That's why he came back. And he's it's always start and stop with him. But they had an opportunity to just get him a win here. This, this show means fucking nothing. But what happened was they stayed the course. He was likely booked to lose to Hammerstone. So they said, now we got to give him an opponent to, to lose to as well. And they made it someone who was half his size. Again, we don't know what they're doing here in the future. We have no clue. All we can do is, is work with the information they have given us. And it just didn't make a lot of sense. So we'll see what happens. Cody, Cody Diener came out, and this is a complete bomb. I, shit, when I was at the taping and Hammerstone challenged into an arm wrestling match and Cody Diener led it, you know, left it up to the people, do you want to see an arm wrestling match or a Sin City street fight? I am in my chair. I'm in my seat yelling, arm wrestling, like that. I did not want to see another street fight. I had no interest in that. This Cody Diener character is horrendous. It has a spot on the card, though. So I'm not, I'm not saying, um, you know, repackage the dude. I'm not saying fire him. There's a spot on the card for it. He doesn't beat anyone. He's a jobber. There's a spot on the card. I'm not. I'm just saying it's also not good. But it works for him. Whatever. The the problem though, when they Diener is almost ruining matches at this point. When he comes out and, and the angles he's doing is almost ruining things, which is a problem. He's not actually feuding with anyone. He's just interrupting. And I don't know if the people actually really care. <laughs> They're just I don't know. But um he came out, AJ Francis whooped his ass. And then uh oh, this was a no contest, huh? I could have swore I remember seeing. Give me a second here. Ends a match into the swell. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It restarted in a tag team match. That's what it was. And then it wasn't. Rich Swan beat him. So they made him look like an absolute fucking idiot. I'm cool with first class winning, though. Jonathan Gresham took on Kushida. Um, I'm not going to lie. I was a little in and out during this match because I had something going on. But I like what I saw. I don't like the the choking on the the ink and all that. But this character, this Jonathan Gresham octopus character, can really really work. I'm really interested in it. This is what I liked about this match. Jonathan Gresham's wrestling. Some of the shit he was doing was this guy's so ahead of his time. It's crazy. Working the body parts and and just he's an incredible technical wrestler. He needed the character, and now he's got the character. But here's what I liked about it. When they announced that Kushida was a signing several weeks, several months ago, I'm like, okay, he's part of the time machine and time splitters and time after time. Those characters, the Motor City Machine Gun, they're bland, they're boring, they're good little hands, okay? So Kushida works with that, whatever. But once they said those guys were gone, I've been sitting here thinking to myself, what the hell are they going to do with Kushida? He's not going to get on there and cut promos in English. So I said, what the hell are they going to do? How can you possibly get this guy involved in storylines? And they were able to tell a story here without without talking. You know, like they, they just went into it to have a good match. And Jonathan Gresham has got the, the ink and it's getting all over him and it chokes, chokes him out. And now there's a story here. How they're going to build on it, I don't know. I don't know how Kushida is going to communicate with us that he wants his revenge on Jonathan Gresham. I don't know. I would keep Kushida off TV for a couple months recovering, you know, like really sell out, sell the ink and then attack him. Like don't have him on the next episode and, and find a way to give him a mic. Just, just don't. What I did not like about this 
was so Tom Hannafin has his little phrases. One of them is when the match is over, he has a few ways of delivering it, but for the most part, it's so and so beats so and so. So when you have a match like this where Jonathan Gresham is just randomly got all this ink coming from all, all over and he chokes this guy out and then the match is over. He doesn't choke him, but he pins him for the three count. He he kind of suffocates him or whatever he does. You can't be like, Gresham beats Kushida. Like it's some sporting competition. Like it's on par with everything else here they're doing on the card. Like he really needed to say, like, what the fuck is going on here? You know, and, and just really start communicating to us that they're concerned about Kushida and what, you know, what did we just see? But in Russian beats Kushida, like, like these motherfuckers have this Matt classic two out of three falls. One of them's a title holder. That just didn't work for me, man. Like when you got a story going here in the beginning of this Jonathan Gresham character, which is really interesting. I think most people find it interesting. There was there were some parts of it people weren't into, but I think the most, for the most part, people are very interested in it. And to be able to feud with Kushida of all people, this is interesting. So I just think that the commentary has to tell a better story than treating something like this as a one-on-one -on -one sporting event. Like these guys, like Jonathan Gresham just out wrestled him. You know, you understand what I'm saying? Now we start going down. Jordan Grace and PCO take on Steph DeLander and Big Con. I told my son when this match came on that there was a higher probability of me giving birth and delivering the baby myself than Steph DeLander and Con winning this match. And that is exactly the outcome we got. The gift that keeps on giving, PCO versus Con. I thought Jordan Grace doing the entrance with PCO was cool in the beginning. Khan clearly cannot beat PCO. Steph Double D Lander clearly, clearly cannot beat Jordan Grace. They are both 0-3 versus these people. Put an end to this. There's no way Steph Delander's back on the screen after this. There's no way. And there's a lot her and Cardona could have done. But obviously Cardona got hurt. They had to insert Khan. I don't, man, this was – just please move on from, from whatever you're doing here. Do not – when this next set of tapings comes out, I swear to you, if Steph Delander comes out and fucks with Jordan Grace or PCO and Khan lay a pinky on each other, I'm going to lose my mind. We already know how this match ended. I'm not even going to talk about it any further. Mustafa Ali took on Ace Austin. This was what uh, people – People seem to find this to be their favorite match or one of the two favorite matches on the card. And it was. It was really interesting because they're still doing this storyline with Ace Austin. I don't know if it's interesting, but they're still doing it with him and Chris Bay. Mustafa Ali has beat both of these guys now. I thought the match with Chris Bay on Impact was a lot better. <laughs> that was, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I, I think they're going to use Mustafa Ali and being an unbeatable, unbeatable X Division champion, they're going to use that to find a way to break up the ABC. Again, there's no reason to break them up. There is no no reason, just like they're saying in the storyline, there's no reason they can't just chase individual success and remain as a tag team. As a matter of fact, it would freshen them up. Just don't have them wrestle as a tag team for a while. They can be involved with each other, but let, let them do individual stuff. Find a way, find interesting feuds for them to do individually and then bring them back together as a tag team like they're able to do that with the motor city machine guns a little bit find just find a way don't break these guys up um but the i think my only real issue with the match was that i knew the outcome from the beginning and it's always a little hard for me to get into those those kind of matches but this was this was one of the redeeming qualities about the show. It's one of the things that saved the show from being a complete bomb. Mustafa Ali, everything he's done is great. I sound like Tony Khan. It's great. Everything's great. Everything done from the wrestling, the character work. Like there's a little bit of bad comedy, but he's convincing, so he pulls it off. But it's still bad comedy, which I can I can do with a hundred percent less of that in wrestling. 
people love to justify it's wrestling. Don't take it serious. Like it has to be good too. You know, what other, what other industry relies on bad comedy to get over, you know? But yeah, obviously Mustafa Ali won this. Um, I don't know what's next for him. As I said, I expect him to lose to Jake ultimately. I don't, I don't know what's next though. And now we got the main event of this program. Ball of Speed and Trent the Seventh with Matt Hardy going against the system. Folks, this un this over delivered. I said under because it's under siege. This over delivered like a motherfucker. If you did not watch this, if you were there's I saw plenty of people like, I don't want to watch under siege because there's nothing interesting on it. Watch this. Watch Jonathan Gresham. Yeah, and that that was kind of hit or miss with the people. But I mean, watch the gimmick, watch it come to fruition after we've been seeing the vignettes. Watch that. Watch ASOS and Ali if you want to. Watch this. Watch this main event. I didn't think Broken Matt Hardy could go. I mean, he can't, but it worked. He made it work here. I'm sitting here watching this main event. Like, why am I watching these dude jobbers team up with? with matt hardy and then i'm thinking also that team is also going to win this system here with titles i did an upload on the channel last week or maybe it was a week before that talking about the system and their winning ways and their winning streak they're not losing like ove and and honor no more and these other groups that they try to put together where we keep saying yo they should be running through the company these guys are winning they started off with a couple losses and they're like unbeatable. This is something I've been asking for for a long time. A lot of fans have. But I didn't have interest in the match initially because I was like, well, Matt Hardy is going to pin Brian Myers and they're going to justify his number one contendership. This match went long. And as much as I don't like long wrestling matches, I was very engaged in what, what they were doing. Everyone played their part really well mike bailey and trent seven when they put on those garments they were like reborn two guys that i've just had no interest in they're completely reborn trent seven if you if you go back and watch the match he looks like someone cast to play the role of broken matt hardy in a movie about jeff hardy it like you'll see what i'm talking about it's almost knockoffish <laughs> But this was really entertaining. The wrestling was good. And, and you're, you're watching it thinking, okay, we're just waiting for Matt Hardy to find a way to win this match. And then in the end, the system wins again, which was the right thing to do so they can go off screen with all of them holding their titles up. The Speedball Mountain cannot beat these guys. They have wrestled one-on-one. -on -one. They have wrestled tag team matches. They cannot beat them. They're giving Spielball Mountain no momentum whatsoever. They've lost so much more than they've won. But when they got these alter egos, it gave them a complete new, a new life. Like if they continue to put them in main events and stuff, I wouldn't even be mad. And I don't know if they're going to carry this over. This might have been a, you know, Hey, we did this for the show. I don't really know. But I'm really interested in it. And I, I really I really think you people who didn't watch it will find that this over-delivered and that it was extremely entertaining. And the crowd was into it. The weird thing is that the system won. How are we going to get Matt Hardy from point A to point B to where he's a number one contender? Why? How how do you even justify him wrestling for that at this point? So this is going to be uh, these next these cup, next couple episodes. It's going to it's going to be interesting. How are we going to get Matt Hardy versus Moose? It's probably going to be at Against All Odds or whatever that show is. I, I highly doubt it's Slammiversary. And then you got to remember Josh Alexander is floating around as the number one contender too, which again I thought was just absolutely fucking unnecessary because you know you're not going to do Josh Alexander versus Matt Hardy. So you're already giving away that the that Moose is going to beat Matt. Like I don't know why they don't just focus on one storyline at a time. There is there's no valid reason 
at least at this point with the information we've been given that Josh needs to be one number one contender right now. I think we just got to focus. We didn't focus on the under, under siege came together in two weeks. So now this next show I think is against all odds. Find a way to hook us. You got plenty of time to hook us into this. But I was, um, I'm, I'm happy with the outcome. I'm glad the system won. I want the system to keep winning. But man, um, you got to watch this match. You know, I'm not going to go blow for blow because that's not how I review. Uh, but I, I really, I just did not expect the system winning. It's, it's, you know, over the years, it's been really rare that the company has gone off the air with heels celebrating. I go all the way back to Eli Drake. I used to talk about this all the time. I was like, they never go off the air with him on top when he was the champion. I should say they do the same with Moose because like, say the system wins in the main event of the show. There's always the the Nick Nemeths or whatever who come down and, and take them out and then leave with their hands in the air. There's always a way to get Moose and the system on their ass to go off the air. If you think about Moose winning the title at Hard to Kill, Moose goes off the air on his ass. You think about Moose going off the air in Rebellion, he goes off the air on his ass. You know, like they actually had the system coming off Dominic here for once. So good on you, TNA. As I said, man, if you, if you do something good, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to praise you for it. I'm going to say you're doing a great job. If you do some shit like PCO versus Khan and it stinks, I'm going to tell you it stinks. You know, it's whatever. Uh, that's going to do it for me, folks. I feel like this slow this uh, review is a little slow and plotting, a little bit boring. I'm just tired. So I apologize for that. But if you're still rocking with me, I appreciate you. I'm your boy, BQ. I will be talking to you soon. Peace.